This is Mark Filler. Uh, today we're talking about web warp in the cloud. I'm going to start with a quick presentation uh, just to, so, uh, to give you a perspective. Uh, I, know, I know there are a lot of people who are not familiar with web warp uh, joining the webinar, so let me start by giving you a very brief introduction uh, about what web warp is, just, just to put things in perspective. So what is web warp? Well, first and foremost, it is an integration server. Uh, I'm going to have just one slide on what is web warp, so it's kind of difficult to describe a product that has been in development for almost eight years in a single slide. But as an integration server, this, uh, uh, this product provides an ability to integrate client-side application with the server-side resources. Uh, whether you have .NET backend or Java backend or PHP, we provide the facilities to integrate whatever you have on the server-side with the client-side application. Second, it is a data management server. So if the server-side resources that you expose to a client-side application are uh, in, a, in a persistent or relational storage, then we provide the framework and infrastructure to integrate those uh, resources in the database with the client-side uh, through the code generation, through the actual runtime API. So if you are building a data-driven application and web work, gives you an ability to integrate the client side with the server side where web work manages the data and manages access to the data. And finally, it is a messaging server. So if you're building an, an application that deals a lot of uh, deals with messages being pushed uh, from one client to the server side or from the server to the client side in the form of data push or in the form of integration with some message queuing systems, then web work provides access for that as well. And finally, it is a developer productivity tool. So for all, the, for all these three things that you see, the third, uh, first three bullets, we provide uh, resources to the developers to make it easier to develop applications, uh, whether you're doing integration or data management or messaging. And those productivity tools are, are, are made available to you in the form of code generation, templates for IDEs, uh, various uh, utilities that we provide. So this is kind of an, a, a very general overview of, of web work. Now, uh, before we actually delve into the cloud, cloud uh, a, a brief overview of what we have today and how it is relevant to the cloud. So first of all, integration matrix. So if you have uh, .NET backend, Java, or PHP, uh, which are shown right here at the top header of this table, and uh, the actual client sides are shown on the left-hand side. So everything that has an X is supported today. So if, you, if you're building a JavaScript AJAX application and need to integrate it with .NET backend or Java or PHP, then this is available. So as you can see right now, the, the, we, we, we don't currently provide integration with IOM. So this is something that we're working on. So by the way, with, with these integration matrix, this is the first uh, one that I'm going to show you. And there are, there are a few more that are coming up. Anything that doesn't have uh, an X in the cells, our goal is to provide that uh, functionality this year. So we're very actively working on filling these holes. So iOS is, is coming coming uh, later this year. So this is this is from the remoting perspective. So if you have an EGB or Pojo on the Java side, or just Spring.NET object, or just .NET object on the .NET side then these clients can get access to these resources through web work. As far as data management matrix, we do, uh, our data management framework currently is oriented uh, towards flex clients. And we're working on addressing the need for Ajax, Android, and iOS clients for, uh, for the data management that is supported by web work. Uh, so as, as you can see, these three uh, but these nine cells are going to be uh, filled in later this year as well. Messaging matrix, so if you have an MSMQ or NMS backend with uh, various messaging infrastructures which, uh, you know, let's say support NMS, then today you can connect to that resource from Flex, from Ajax, and from Android. And uh, iOS is once again something that, that is missing. Okay, so everything that I just described to you uh, it has direct uh, relation to the cloud. So as far as the actual cloud matrix, where things stand today, you can take WebWorker.net and deploy it into Azure. 
Uh, WebWorkFor.net would not be applicable to Google App Engine for the reason that Google GAE supports uh, only Java and Python. So WebWorkFor.net would not be applicable here. And we're working on uh, create a packaging WebWorkFor.net uh, for Amazon EC2. As far as WebWork for Java, uh, Azure uh, does not natively support Java backends. Uh, so we, we have targeted and uh, provided uh, support for Google App Engine. And right now, PHP, we, we haven't done anything to provide support for Azure or Amazon EC2. So today, in, in this presentation, I will be talking about primarily Microsoft Azure and Google App Engine. But uh, once we have addressed other needs, specifically EC2 for all backends and Azure for PHP, we will be scheduling additional webinars to give you an overview of how uh, these uh, these products and uh, these cloud environments uh, can be integrated together. And uh, uh, there's another cloud matrix for the feature view. So remoting, data management, messaging are available uh, with Web Work for .NET in Microsoft Azure environment. And all three are available in Google App Engine for Java. And uh, as soon as we have builds of .NET, uh, Web Work for Java, .NET, and PHP for Amazon EC2, then we'll be putting our access in these cells as well. Now, by the way, if you have any questions uh, or comments, please uh, use the go to webinar control panel that you have to send, uh, send the messages here. I'll be periodically checking them. Uh, in fact, I see there are some questions now. So, and uh, I really don't mind interruptions, so it's, uh, I'll be periodically checking the questions and uh, try to answer as we go. So one of the questions that we have right now, if there are any plans for mobile apps. Uh, let me go back a few slides. So right here, let's say for integration matrix. So if for mobile apps, the primary, like let's say primary three types of front ends would be JavaScript, AJAX, HTML5, Android, and iOS. So right now, as far as JavaScript being able to invoke .NET or Java or PHP backends, we do provide JavaScript capability to, to do that. Android, either as an Air deployment or as a Java deployment, can integrate with WebWorkFor.net for Java and PHP. And iOS, we currently don't support, but it's something that we're working on. Uh, as far as the data management, right now we, there is nothing that we provide for data management for Android, JavaScript, or iOS. So this is this is a fairly significant effort that we have to extend our data management framework to the mobile applications. And as far as messaging, you can uh, integrate Android as an Air or Java with .NET backend or Java. And once again, we don't have anything for for iOS. So that should that should answer the question. Uh, as far as the mobile apps. Uh, there's another question. Abby is asking if the video streaming will be available on EC2 as well. Yes, definitely. So pretty much everything that you know today about web work is going to be available for all cloud backends. So right now, if we take, uh, let's say, webwork4.net, and we have this X right here for Microsoft Azure, then everything that webwork4.net provides today, remoting, data management, and messaging, is available in the Azure environment. And the same thing is going to be true with EC2 as well. Okay, all right. All right. Let's let's move on. So this is the product view, and uh, once again, I think I think I already covered the feature view. So so this should should give you uh, a perspective on where we are where we are today and where things are going as far as web work and the cloud support. So with that said, I'm going to. Uh, uh, just jump into a few demonstrations just, just to show you how things uh, are working today. By the way, there is another question as far as the time frame for EC2. Uh, EC2, we, we plan to uh, release both WebWork for .NET and WebWork for Java around the same time that provides EC2 capability. Uh, it's going to, the, the, the way we're going about this is uh, we will be providing AMIs for both .NET and Java that you can deploy and configure uh, configure accordingly so the billing takes place as well. I'm going to describe billing in just a second. Uh, as far as the time frame, it is, it is more than likely about three to four months out or sooner. So I'd rather give you a longer time frame and deliver sooner rather than being the other way around. So at this point, it's, it's more than likely three to four months out. 
Okay. So um, let's talk about before before I give you any demos. Let's talk about how actual pricing works. Uh, so for that, uh, let me open a web page. That that talks about web work for cloud. So right here, uh, this is this is something that we recently started. This web, this page is out there on the website, but it's not accessible directly. So if you know the URL, you can get to it. Uh, as far as the, as far as pricing is concerned, the way web work for cloud is priced is not the same as the premise-based deployments. So we we uh, uh, are exposing it f from the pricing perspective in a very traditional for cloud environments pricing. So it is uh, it is priced on the uh, hourly usage on different types of instances. So and as far as Azure and EC2 are concerned, the larger the instance, the greater is going to be the price, which is fairly standard in the cloud environment as well. As far as Google App Engine, there is only one type of instance, and uh, there is just only one price. So uh, as far as the actual pricing, the way it works is first first you will need to sign up. Uh, and register your credit card, register for billing for a particular deployment. There are three pages where you can sign up. There is a web work for Azure, sign up, uh, EC2, and Google App Engine. The one that is currently live, because you can download and start using it today, is web work for Azure. Uh, we are uh, in the final stages of uh, preparing web work for Java version 4.1, which will include Google App Engine support. So this will be applicable as soon as we do that. Uh, but the way the way this works is if once you go to this page, uh, here you provide your billing information, your contact information, and uh, uh, we have uh, partnered with a with a third party called Chargeify. So as you can see, this it looks like our website, but it's actually hosted on Chargeify uh, server. So once you register, you, you you will be getting subscriber ID. And subscriber ID uniquely identifies you as the customer with us. And that subscriber ID must be used in the configuration of your web work. So whenever you deploy web work, uh, you attach that subscriber ID in the configuration somewhere, and the configuration will vary between Azure and EC2 and Google App Engine. And we try to make it as, uh, as natural as possible for that particular environment. Uh, and uh, once web work starts, and as soon as there is a full hour of web work running on, the, on, the, on a particular server, then a billing request goes out to our billing server that says this particular customer has used web work on such and such instance for one hour. What that means is that if you have deployed web work for a partial hour and for whatever reason you shut down that instance or you needed to deploy again and you know, something didn't work out or whatever, you're not getting charged for the partial hours. So it's only for the full hour of runtime of that server being deployed in, in the cloud. Uh, there is a question on what stops you of what stops someone from using someone else's subscriber ID. Real, uh, it's 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 going to be fairly traditional setup where once you configure subscriber ID, it needs to match uh, your uh, your basically identity uniquely. So in addition to subscriber ID, uh, you also need to have the mailing address, the email address that you have. Uh, configured right here whenever you whenever you register it to use uh, web work in the cloud so as as soon as someone knows that subscriber ID in combination with your email address then no one stops using that particular combination to really take advantage of your credit card but uh, if you suspect that something like this might have happened then uh, support is available for you guys that we can quickly uh, look into any pending charges and uh, if something like this happens, you know, regenerate a different subscriber ID. So, uh, but if you have any concerns from the, with that approach, I'd like to hear them and uh, see if we can discuss uh, this topic as well, because this is something that I'm very interested uh, as well. 